The One Straw Revolution by Masanobu Fukuoka. Here's the copy he signed for me. He says, Let the fruits of nature fall into your mouth while lying under a tree doing nothing rather than run about like a fool thinking you're achieving something. This leads to the ideogram of Mu, nothingness, and the bounty of Mother Nature. This is chapter two, three, four, six, seven. Humanity, and it's page 25. Humanity does not know nature. Lately I have been thinking that the point must be reached when scientists, politicians, artists, philosophers, men of religion, and all those who work in the fields should gather here, gaze out over these fields, and talk things over together. I think this is the kind of thing that must happen if people are to see beyond their specialities. Scientists think they can understand nature. That is the stand they take. Because they are convinced that they can understand nature, they are committed to investigate nature. They are committed to investigate nature and putting it to use. I think an understanding of nature lies beyond the reach of human intelligence. I often tell the young people in the huts on the mountain who come here to help out and to learn about natural farming that anybody can see the trees up on the mountain. They can see the green of the leaves. They can see the rice plants. They think they know what green is. In contact with nature morning and night, they sometimes come to think that they know nature. But when they think they are beginning to understand nature, they can be sure that they are on the wrong track. Why is it impossible to know nature? That which is conceived to be nature is only the idea of nature arising in each person's mind. The one who sees true nature are infants. They see without thinking, straight and clear. If even the names of plants are known, a mandarin orange tree of the citrus family, a pine of the pine family, nature is not seen in its true form. An object seen in isolation from the whole is not the real thing. Specialists in various fields gather together and observe a stalk of rice. The insect disease specialist sees only insect damage. The specialist in plant nutrition considers only the plant's vigor. This is unavoidable as things are now. As an example, I told the gentleman from the research station when he was investigating the relation between rice leaf hoppers and spiders in my field, Professor, since you are researching spiders, you are interested in only one among the many natural predator predators of the leaf hopper. This year spiders appeared in great numbers, but last year it was toads. Before that it was frogs that predominated. There are countless variations. It is impossible for specialized research to grasp the role of a single predator at a certain time within the intricacy of insect interrelationships. There are seasons when the leaf hopper population is low because there are many spiders. There are times when a lot of rain falls and frogs cause the spiders to disappear, or when little rain falls and neither leaf hoppers nor frogs appear at all. Methods of insect control, which ignore the relationships among the insects themselves, are truly useless. Research on spiders and leafhoppers must also consider the relationship between frogs and spiders. When things have reached this point, a frog professor will also be needed. Experts on spiders and leafhoppers, another on rice, another expert on water management, will all have to join the gathering. Furthermore, there are four or five different kinds of spiders in these fields. I remember a few years ago when somebody came rushing over to the house early one morning to ask me if I had covered my fields with a silk net or something. I could not imagine what he was talking about, so I hurried straight out to take a look. We had just finished harvesting the rice, and overnight 
the rice stubble and low-lying grasses had become completely covered with spider webs, as though the silk, as though with silk, waving and sparkling with the morning mist. It was a magnificent sight. The wonder of it is that when this happens, as it does only once in a great while, it only lasts for a day or two. If you look closely, there are several spiders in each square inch. They are so thick on the field that there is hardly any space between them. In a quarter acre, there must be how many thousands? How many millions? When you go to look at the field two or three days later, you see that strands of web several yards long have broken off and are waving about in the wind with five or six spiders clinging to each one. It is like when dandelion fluff or pine cone seeds are blown away in the wind. The young spiders cling to the strands and are sent sailing off in the sky. The spectacle is an amazing natural drama. Seeing this, you understand that poets and artists will also have to join in the gathering. When the chemicals are put into the field, this is all destroyed in an instant. I once thought that there would be nothing wrong with putting ashes from the fireplace onto the fields. The result was astounding. Two or three days later, the field was completely bare of spiders. The ashes had caused the strands of web to disintegrate. How many thousands of spiders fell victim to a single handful of this apparently harmless ash? <sighs> Applying an insecticide is not simply a matter of eliminating the leaf hoppers together with their natural predators. Many other essential dramas of nature are affected. The phenomena of these great swarms of spiders which appear in the rice fields in the autumn and like escape artists vanish overnight is still not understood. No one knows where they come from, how they survive the winter or where they go when they disappear. And so the use of chemicals is not a problem for the entomologist alone. Philosophers, men of religion, artists and poets must also help to decide whether or not it is permissible to use chemicals in farming and what the results of using even organic fertilizers might be. We will harvest about 1,300 pounds of rice and 1,300 pounds of winter grain from each quarter acre of this land. If the harvest reaches 29 bushels, as it sometimes does, you might not be able to find a greater harvest if you search the whole country. Since advanced technology has nothing to do with growing this grain, it stands as a contradiction to the assumptions of modern science. Anyone who will come and see these fields and accept their testimony will feel deep misgivings over the question of whether or not humans know nature and of whether or not nature can be known within the confines of human understanding. The irony is that science has served only to show us how small human knowledge is. This is part two of the book. Four principles of natural farming Make your way carefully through these fields. Dragonflies and moths fly up in a flurry. Honeybees buzz from blossom to blossom. Part the leaves and you will see insects, spiders, frogs, lizards and many other small animals bustling about in the cool shade. This is a balanced rice field ecosystem. Insect and plant communities maintain a stable relationship here. It is not uncommon. It is not uncommon for a plant disease to sweep through this area, leaving the crops in these fields unaffected. And now look over at the neighbor's field for a moment. The weeds have all been wiped out by herbicide and cultivation. The soil animals and insects have been exterminated by poison. The soil has been burned clean of organic matter. 
and microorganisms by chemical fertilizers. In the summer, you see farmers at work in the fields wearing gas masks and long rubber gloves. These rice fields, which have been farmed continuously for over 1,500 years, have now been laid waste by the exploitive farming practices of a single generation. Four principles. The first is no cultivation. That is, no ploughing or turning of the soil. For centuries, farmers have assumed that the plough is essential for growing crops. However, non-cultivation is fundamental to natural farming. The earth cultivates itself naturally by means of penetration of plant roots and the activity of microorganisms, small animals and earthworms. The second is no chemical fertilizer or prepared compost. People interfere with nature and try as they may, they cannot heal the resulting wounds. Their careless farming practices drain the soil of essential nutrients and the result is yearly depletion of the land. If left to itself, the soil maintains its fertility naturally in accordance with the orderly cycle of plant and animal life. The third is no weeding by tillage or herbicides. Weeds play their part in building soil fertility and in balancing the biological community. As a fundamental principle, weeds should be controlled, not eliminated. Straw, mulch, a ground cover of white clover interplanted with the crops and temporary flooding provide effective weed control in my fields. The fourth is no dependence on chemicals. From the time that weak plants developed as a result of such unnatural practices as ploughing and fertilising, disease and insect imbalance became a great problem in agriculture. Nature left alone is in perfect balance. Harmful insects and plant diseases are always present but do not occur in nature to an extent which requires the use of poisonous chemicals. The sensible approach to disease and insect control is to grow sturdy crops in a healthy environment. When the soil is cultivated, the natural environment is altered beyond recognition. The repercussions of such acts have caused the farmer's farmer nightmares for countless generations. For example, when a natural area is brought under the plough, very strong weeds such as crabgrass and docks sometimes come to dominate the vegetation. When these weeds take hold, the farmer is faced with a nearly impossible task of weeding each year. Very often the land is left abandoned. In coping with problems such as these, the only sensible approach is to discontinue the natural practices which have brought about the situation in the first place. Let me just show you a photo of Walker San in his field, in his mountain. The farmer also has a responsibility to repair the damage he has caused. Cultivation of the soil should be discontinued. If gentle measures such as spreading straw and sowing clover are practiced, instead of using man-made chemicals and machinery to wage a war of annihilation, then the environment will move back towards its natural balance, and even troublesome weeds can be brought under control. Fertilizer. I have been known in chatting with soil fertility experts to ask, if a field is left to itself, Will the soil's fertility increase or will it become depleted? They usually pause and say something like, well, let's see, it'll become depleted. No, not when you remember that when rice is grown for a long time in the same field without fertilizer, the harvest settles at around 525 pounds per quarter acre. The earth would become neither enriched nor depleted. These specialists are referring to a cultivated flooded field. If nature is left to itself, fertility increases. Organic remains of plants and animals accumulate and are decomposed on the surface by bacteria and fungi, 
with the movement of rainwater, the nutrients are taken deep into the soil to become food for microorganisms, earthworms and other small animals. Plant roots reach to the lower soil strata and draw the nutrients back to the surface. If you want to get an idea of the natural fertility of the earth, take a walk on the wild mountainside sometime and look at the giant trees that grow without fertilizer and without cultivation. The fertility of nature as it is, is beyond reach of the imagination. Cut down the natural forest cover, plant Japanese red pine or cedar trees for a few generations and the soil will become depleted and open to erosion. On the other hand, take a barren mountain with poor red clay soil and plant pine or cedar with a ground cover of clover and alfalfa alpha as the green manure enriches and softens the soil, weeds and bushes grow up below the trees and a rich cycle of regeneration is begun. There are instances in which the top four inches of soil have become enriched in less than 10 years. For growing agricultural crops, also the use of prepared fertilizer can be discontinued. For the most part, a permanent green manure cover and the return of all straw and chaff to the soil will be sufficient. To provide animal manure to help decompose the straw, I used to let ducks loose in the field. If they are introduced as ducklings, while the seedlings are still young, the ducks will grow up together with the rice. Ten ducks will supply all the manure necessary for a quarter acre and will also, <coughs> also help to control the weeds. I did this for many years until the construction of a national highway made it impossible for the ducks to get across the road and back to the coop. Now I use a little chicken manure to help decompose the straw. In other areas, ducks or other small grazing animals are still a practical possibility. Adding too much fertility fertilizer can lead to problems. One year, right after rice transplanting, I contracted to rent one and a quarter acres of freshly planted rice fields for a period of one year. I ran all the water out of the fields and proceeded without chemical fertilizer, applying only a small amount of chicken manure. Four of the fields developed normally, but in the fifth, no matter what I did, the rice plants came up too thickly and were attacked by blast disease. When I asked the owner about this, he said he had used the field over the winter as a dump for chicken manure. Using, green, using straw, green manure and a little poultry manure, one can get high yields without adding compost or commercial fertilizer at all. For several decades now, I have been sitting back observing nature's method of cultivation and fertilization. And while watching, I have been reaping bumper crops of vegetables, citrus, rice and winter grain as a gift, so to speak, from the natural fertility of the earth. Coping with weeds. Here are some key points to remember in dealing with weeds. As soon as cultivation is discontinued, the number of weeds decreases sharply. Also, the variety of weeds in a given field will change. If seeds are sown while the preceding crop is still ripening in the field, those seeds will germinate ahead of the weeds. Winter weeds sprout only after the rice has been harvested. But by that time, the winter grain already has a head start. Summer weeds sprout right after the harvest of barley and rye, but the rice is already growing strongly. Timing the seeding in such a way, in such a way, sorry, excuse me. Timing the seeding in such a way that there is no interval between succeeding crops gives the grain a great advantage over the weeds. Directly after the harvest, if the whole field is covered with straw, the germination of weeds is stopped short. White clover sowed with the grain as a ground cover also helps to keep weeds under control. The usual way to deal with weeds is to cultivate the soil. But when you cultivate seeds lying deep in the soil, which would never have germinated otherwise, are stirred up and given a chance to sprout. Furthermore, the quick sprouting, fast growing varieties are given the advantage under these conditions. 
So you might say that the farmer who tries to control weeds by cultivating the soil is quite literally sowing the seeds of his own misfortune. Pest control. Let us say that there are still some people who think that if chemicals are not used, their fruit trees and field crops will wither before their very eyes. The fact of the matter is that by using these chemicals, people have unwittingly brought about the conditions in which this unfounded fear may become reality. Recently, Japanese red pines have been suffering severe damage from, from an outbreak of pine bark weevils. Foresters are now using helicopters in an attempt to stop the damage by aerial spraying. I do not deny that this is effective in the short run, but I know there must be another way. Weevil blights, according to the latest research, are not a direct infestation, but follow upon the action of med mediating nematodes. The nematodes breed within the trunk block the transport of water and nutrients and eventually cause the pine to wither and die. The ultimate cause, of course, is not yet clearly understood. Nematodes feed on a fungus within the tree's trunk. Why did this fungus began to begin to spread so prolifically within the tree? Did the fungus begin to multiply after the nematodes had already appeared? Or did the nematode appear because the fungus was already present? It boils down to a question of which came first the fungus or the nematode. Furthermore, there is another microbe about which very little is known, which always accompanies the fungus, and a very toc and a virus toxic to the fungus. Effect following effect in every direction, the only thing that can be said with certainty is that the pine trees are withering in unusual numbers. People cannot know what the true cause of the pine blight is, nor can they know the ultimate consequence of their remedy. If the situation is meddled with unknowingly, that only sows the seeds for the next great catastrophe. No, I cannot rejoice in the knowledge that immediate damage from the weevil has been reduced by chemical spraying. Using agricultural chemicals is the most inept way to deal with problems such as these and will only lead to greater problems in the future. These four principles of natural farming no cultivation, no chemical fertilizer or prepared compost, no weeding by tillage or herbicide, and no dependence on chemicals comply with the natural order and lead to the replenishment of nature's richness. All my fumblings have run along this line of thought. It is the heart of my method of growing vegetables, grain, and citrus. Thank you. More to come soon.